<laughs> Happy Hump Day! Happy Hump Day. Oh. Mm. And it's, it's December, we're trying to be very Christmassy themed. I've got a little. This is all I had, but they're like Christmas. Yeah, I've got earrings in, I've got angels in. Oh. Like you can see, I've got angel earrings in. Yeah. Yeah. So... A lot of Christmas earrings going on. Mm. Getting, to, getting in the mood. Actually, I haven't put any decorations up yet. I'm really going to get to that yeah. this weekend. That's my, my next. Do you put them up at your place? No, I'm very lazy. I did do it like the first year or whatever I moved in, but then I realized I have to take them down. And I was one of the people who had them up like till January or something. And then I was like, oh God, I can't do that. So now I just, I'm like, oh, it's fine. Oh, that's fine. Mm, it's true. But in theory, you don't really celebrate Christmas. Mm, yeah, in theory, I guess. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I don't. I don't go to church or anything, so no. Yes. I mean I I celebrate Christmas with you guys. That's all Yeah, that's nice. Yeah. You like, like that. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Mm. Um I like the food and yeah. yeah. Mostly. And the presents. But yes, it's quite nice. It's good food. Mm-hmm. <gasps> did you have a good week? Yes. And by going, what did I do? Yes. Um, what did I do? Actually, last weekend I started my Christmas shopping. Um, that's what I did. So I'm nearly finished. I still got a couple of presents um, to do, and then a cards because I need to send them this weekend to get home. I like to do written cards to my family in the UK. Oh, that's lovely. So I always write cards. Do you know what though? It's so ridiculous. It costs me just to send the card. I spent forty dollars in stamps. Oh my god! Just to send cards to my family cost more, nearly as much as the cards. Mm, yeah, but, yeah. So it's a bit. It's an expense just sending cards. Yeah. So they don't get. I don't send gifts so much as yeah. cards. Yeah, that's mad. Well, gifts would be crazy then. I usually just say, "What well, I usually do send a hamper and say that's your crit. That's the family gift from me." Oh, yeah. That's what I usually do, and do it online. That's usually what I do. Um, and then that's it. They get a hamper and they get a card from me, unless I'm there, and then I can buy yeah. actual presents. And then my mum wine, my mum winches every year. I don't know what to get you. Like, you don't need to get me anything. Just send me a card. Yeah. And she's like, no, I'm gonna get you something. I don't know what to get you. I can't send you something because it costs more to send than what it cost. Yes, exactly. <laughs> So, um, um, and my mum's not very te- te- techy online so yeah. I've just suggested just get something online you can send the links and I, I just think she probably needs VPN though because uh, Australian stuff anyway she's yeah. not she doesn't have to figure it out so it's all good fair enough uh, do, you, do you buy presents in your family for each no. other no no because yeah. you don't celebrate it Although one year, randomly, my mum, because she always has this little Christmas tree, you know, that she puts out. And, um, yeah, one year, randomly, she decided to give us l- literally white envelopes with money in it, <laughs> like plain envelopes with money in it. I was like, that's lovely. Mm. <laughs> it was so random. I mean, very well appreciated. But, um, yes, yeah, very random because my Brothers tend to travel during that time. Yeah. So, um, they're usually not here, so. I actually I have a question for you, right? So you are not, you do not celebrate Christmas. Mm-hmm. And do people say to you Merry Christmas? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I say yeah. to people Merry Christmas. And you say to people Merry Christmas, cool. Yeah, because cool. I was, I heard some, overheard someone the other day go Merry Christmas and then they go, oh, can I still say that? And they said, um, Oh, you don't I don't know what you're allowed to say these days, right? And I was just like, I didn't say anything because it wasn't my conversation. I was over here listening. Yeah. Yeah. Um I kind of wish I had now, but yes, this is all this happens to me all the time. Yeah. Hear things, they annoy me. <laughs> and but they're not I'm I'm not in the conversation. Yeah. And so I don't say anything. But I mean why wouldn't you be allowed to say Merry Christmas? Well, and this, this is me making up the story behind this. Yeah. This is a whole, oh, we're so politically correct. 
you can't even say Merry Christmas anymore because there's people that don't celebrate Christmas and that's seen that's perceived to be um yeah. not okay, right? Yeah. So that's how I that's the story I'm telling myself about yeah. this conversation with the people that are having it. Um and I just like who cares? I have never met someone who does not celebrate Christmas, not yet, yeah. that gets offended. Yeah. Um, I haven't I haven't heard of people even being offended. I think the whole the only reason it's a topic is just to recognize that people have different yeah. um holidays that are important to them. Mm. And you can end up work and I guess in the workplace it's like, well, not everybody celebrates Christmas, and that's fine, but I've never met anyone that's poo pooing that. The only difference I've seen over the years recently is because now people realize Diwali is a thing. Like it's more, just more prominent. And, you know, I, if I take leave, I can say, oh, I'm taking it for Diwali or whatever. Mm. And people say happy Diwali to me. Yeah. Like random. Which is nice. Which is nice, which is lovely. Um, so that's the only thing that, that just, it doesn't mean that, you don't do Christmas. I do Christmas. And our actually at our Christmas party, one of my favorite things is doing the carols. Like everybody's like, oh last year they're like, Mina wants to sing carols. Oh wow, do so you like singing carols? <laughs> yeah, I do. I didn't know that. <laughs> but um my boss, my director, he'd picked really like because he's he's in an a cappella group and he sings like wow. Um, and lots of the doctors, they actually play instruments. They're all very musical and talented. But he picked really, like, intense carols to sing and all the young generations were like, we've never even heard of this. I'm going to say, what's an intense I don't know this carol? I think I'd, I'd heard it anyway. It just looked. And this year they were like, can we sing Jingle Bells? Can we not? <laughs> Well, it seems like Deck the Holes or something. Yeah, maybe. I can't. I don't remember. Oh, that's, I didn't know you liked, oh, we have to do carols at Christmas <laughs> just for you. <laughs> oh, it was just random because, you know, somebody plays the piano and then, yeah. Oh, yeah, it's pretty impressive. Yes. That is pretty cool. Oh, wow. Oh, but yeah, that, that was the conversation I heard. I was just like, oh, come on. Yeah, it's just about recognising that other people celebrate different a significant holidays for them yeah. and then recognizing that yeah exactly. and I don't see anybody getting offended if you say Merry Christmas and they don't celebrate Christmas yeah exactly you know if you're so concerned then just say happy holidays like exactly if you're so concerned or worried about saying the wrong thing just say happy holidays happy holidays yeah exactly yeah <laughs> oh dear. Uh, anyway okay um so our first article is from The Guardian, mm-hmm. and the title is Girls Don't Want to Be Leaders, No Wonder, When You See the Violent Abuse They Could Face, and it's written by Emma Beddington. So, um, and there's a picture of Jacinta Ahern. Ahern? Ahern, Ahern, Ahern. Jacinta Ahern. Yes, um, at the front. Um, and it reads that the hashtag girl boss has lost her luster. The recent survey of nine to 18 year old girls reported that they ranked being a leader, the lowest priority in a list of 17 attributes for future work. Girls, the report concludes, were nearly three times as likely to prioritize being healthy and safe, you would hope, and twice as likely to prioritize being respected than being a leader. I like that, weren't the two traditional um, considered complementary. I suppose the fast tragedy of the um, Boisard has estranged concepts to um, leadership and respect so comprehensively that the two can't be in the same country as each other, let alone the same gold-wrapped, wallpaper-wrapped room. She's very um, descriptive. Very visual with her language. Visual. <laughs> Apart from being governed by a man who needed to be penned into a puppy gate, this whole thing about, geez, I don't know. Oh. Um, what's his name? Morrison. Scott Morrison and him. They, I don't know. They, they've just. You mean him taking all the leadership roles across his cabinet? Uh, 
Yeah, but now they've done something in Parliament. They've passed something that says he can't release statements or I don't know, something like that. Apparently it's the first time that's ever been done. It just seems like a dog's breakfast. Anyway, what has turned young women off leadership? There's the perennial you can't be what you can't see issue. Women remain dramatically underrepresented as CEOs and on boards. The COVID bulletproof glass ceiling. I've never heard that term. Uh, a survey quoted by Thomas Chamro Permuzi um, in his pathetically titled book, Why Do So Many Incompetent Men, <laughs> men Become Leaders? And that's uh, true. <laughs> yes. I'm not, I'm not being funny. Yeah. I see it all the time. And I see, I'm not saying there wouldn't be incompetent women, but because there's so few women leaders anyway, mm. it's. If there was, it's not as noticeable. But there are so many incompetent leaders, I don't know. So many. Oh, yes, indeed. Um, found that 92% of Americans couldn't name a female leader in tech and a quarter of the remaining 8% of offered Alexa or Siri. <laughs> as female leaders. <laughs> yes, exactly, in tech. Like, okay, fair enough. The Reykjavik. Um, index measuring attitudes towards women in leadership in G7 countries hasn't improved since 2019, with the most recent reporting report concluding deeply rooted views on female leadership are hard to shift. So this whole theme, you know, I've, you know, you've heard that whole thing about um, if you have a female boss, it's just harder that they're not as good and whatever else. I haven't uh, heard that, but tell me, tell me. No, I think I've heard it a few times. People mention, oh, it's harder to have a female boss um, because they're so emotional and they're so, you know, I don't know, something stupid. I've, I've, I've never had, you know, people say I've never had a good female boss, you know. And you say it. No, my boss right now is a female. And she's yeah, like, I'm saying you say she, you saying she's got a good female boss. You've mentioned it. Oh, something. yeah, no, she's amazing. Like, yeah. Um, uh, the bosses before her wasn't wonderful, um, but to be honest, my male bosses haven't been wonderful either. But I think that's that's been because um, they're not very management trained. You know? Yeah, they're not. They're, not everybody's a leader or a manager. Exactly. Um, just because you get the title doesn't mean to say, hmm. yeah, that you you are you are it. What I've noticed is there's a, a huge difference between. Um, male or female, if they've been management trained and they mm. are leaders, you know, as mm. a boss, mm. yeah. So mm. uh, that's what makes the difference: the training and the attitude, and the yeah, not so much the gender. Um, so that's yeah. Anyway, um, so plus the UN says that um, we are still two hundred and seventy fifty seven years away from the gender pay parity by which time our current reckoning the few survivors of any sex living in um burnt out craigs will be more pressing will more, have more pressing matters to worry about um so which you know i imagine there would be um there are more female leaders in public life than ever before a dizzying 30 female leaders of state or government about 15 percent what a time to be a woman. But it doesn't look um, much fun, does it? J- Jacinta Ahern, Adern, yeah, and her colleagues have faced a raising tide of misogyny, including th- threats of rape and murder. Jeez. Oh, um, Finnish Prime Minister Senna Marine's cheery um, looking night out led to weeks of scandalized comment and drug tests, which we talked about. I can't believe they made her do a drug test. Did they make a drug test? I didn't know that. Neither did I until she's mentioned it. That's ridiculous. Um, Jess Phillips, the other female MPs, have spoken out about the violent abuse they faced. Research earlier this year showed that we, uh, what we know, that as public profile women, as their public profile rises, the scrutiny they face becomes more negative and more quickly, um, more quickly than it does for a man. Well, this happened to um, who is our first and only prime minister? What was her name? Julie Gillard. Yeah, 
like when you cope and I didn't realize at the time but recently they wrote an article about what it was like for her in her terms um and it was quite terrible when you put it all together and look at the picture from the media's point of view like she couldn't do anything right like you know um I think she gave an interview with a basket of fruit on the table and people were like oh my god like why would she put fruit there oh I don't know something it was so ridiculous um and of course the fact that you know she was not married she was with her partner that was a problem yeah 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 and that she didn't have children oh that was a problem (laughs) so anyway um who wouldn't be put off if that is what awaits you in leadership but it's a shame the difference is not glaring but women do outperform men as leaders um shamaro primozik sorry about that quotes a meta-analysis of research on the topic which shows women's leadership strategies are more effective than men's they have more flexible and creative approaches to problem solving a fairer and more objective with subordinates and communicate more effectively and get more respect. See, girls, you can have it both. Yeah, I don't know. I am thinking, I, I am left thinking vaguely contradictory things. One is that teenage girls should do whatever they damn well like. Life is tough enough for them without being subjected to um, our hand wringing at their lack of leadership ambition. When the system is skewed against you, why not say sod it? But an um, alpaca herder make vegan muffins or go live on a tree. Yeah, yeah. and I'll just be an alpaca herder or go make vegan muffins or go and live in a tree. Yeah, oh, I see. Yes, that didn't make sense to me. I should say to everyone, not quite awake yet. Sorry. <laughs> Um, but the world is also a bleak place for women and girls who are not in charge the less power you have the more vulnerable you are to those who abuse their powers Um, in the US women's reproductive choices are scrutinized and criminalized girls are even deleting their period trackers for fear of reprisals women in Afghanistan are banned from traveling and women and girls are forced to study in secret Then, of course, there is Iran, and I've been watching, terrified, wondering in awe at the bravery and spirit of young girls and teenage, um, young women and teenage girls, giving the accolades, the, um, no, I don't know what this word is, somebody the finger, I'm guessing the government, um, waving their headscarves and um, heckling uh, paramilitarians. Um, They shouldn't need to be leading the charge, risking their lives to challenge a regime policing its twisted ideas of women's morality with murderous violence. The world has failed them as it fails so many girls and women. But that's the thing about leadership. When the alternative is bad enough, sometimes it is thrust upon you. So, Mm. yes, Um, that's very sad. I think... um, I think it's like 14,000 people arrested in Iran now, so. It's getting insane, yes. isn't it? But she's right, like, young women, they're probably in their 20s or whatever, hmm. are really risking their lives, and that's so brave. <clears throat> I don't know how brave, if I would be that brave, I have a life to think I would be. Um, Knowing you would be arrested, because pretty much everybody who's speaking out is being arrested. being arrested. Well, it's just not even that. It's like the alternative. You're weighing up the alternatives. Um, the alternatives got to be what feel worse for them, and the, I guess now it is, especially when that other woman was dying in custody, and so many women do. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I did recently see a post with um, the Iranian women's football team, and they had taken off their hijabs. And um, did they? They all did. Yeah. Good. They all did. Um, so that was that was brave, brave. and scary. So yeah, because they could all be arrested, right? Yeah. Well, the the I think the captain of the football team was arrested, wasn't it? In our last article, so um, because he was quite outspoken. Oh, and, that was the male football team. Yeah. Yeah. Not, yeah. So I just feel like this is what I feel like. I'm, I'm just from what I'm seeing, the people that really stick out the neck. Mm. Like, really stick out there and the people that it affects. Like, yeah. that male captain, it was because he was Kurdish and 
and they are obviously not as yes maybe treated like second class citizens I don't know exactly and then in the women it affects them personally I think they're the ones really sticking out their necks mm-hmm. I'm not saying they don't have support mm. they do but they're the, they're the ones really sticking out their necks and we really need more yeah more support from other people mm, these things. yeah because and even in like non like even in other countries it's obviously the Iranians Iranian descendants who are speaking out on social media and things like that because obviously it's their um they feel it more I guess um mm. and I feel like sometimes why isn't the world paying attention you know what is yeah. the rest of us doing so oh, but it's the same with Afghanistan so that was shocking like when all of that happened and we, there was a lot of talk around it when it first happened and then it sort of died down and now it is what it is I guess mm-hmm. with the Taliban in power so yeah people lose interest same with the, I feel like it's the same with the Ukrainian war mm, yeah exactly it's still going on but no less and less in the news Mm. oh dear yes terrible um and i don't even know what midterms are really in the u.s but i think something about political elections but yeah yeah, exactly but i think there's a bit of change happening there but to be honest i haven't been reading very much about it i get a bit exhausted with the u.s politics of it all um it's i don't know seems too um depressing sometimes so yeah is that the end of the story yeah that was the oh end. okay because she said oh what did you say she said something and you said yeah right when you read it out i'm trying to think what it was it was like oh you can have it all you can have it all and oh, you win yeah. that so tell me about that you no know, because i just i don't know I don't know. I just think it's too much pressure to put on women in particular. Nobody says that to men, right? That they can have it all or whatever. Like, it doesn't even apply to men, really. Um, It's like you can, yeah, like, I don't know. It's just a hell of a lot of pressure to be like, oh, yeah, you can can do your job and do the family and do everything else. And, yeah, like. But why does that have to be have it all? Like, it depends what that means for me. The only way I can have it all, if mm. I want to have, if I want, if what I want is a family and if what I want is to be a leader because I feel like one and I feel like I can make a difference. Um, if those are things I want, I'm going to need support to be able to have that. I'm yeah. going to need support from my partner, um, family, friends, um, followers. I'm going yeah. to need support. So in that sense, you can have it all. Mm. But if have it all means I have to do everything myself, yeah, then that's not really going to work, is it? Yeah. And that's the difference because the perception is men have the support of their wife or partner mm. doing that for them. Mm. Or, but I mean, you can pay someone. I know a lot of people don't want to have pay people yeah. look after their kids. Then you have to make a have a discussion and make a choice, don't it? Yeah, exactly. But I mean, I don't know. I feel like the standard for me, I think the standards are more of an issue than everything else. I mean, women people should be um pursuing whatever goals they f- feel that they want to pursue. Mm. But sometimes I feel with um especially with social media and things like that, to be able to have it all together as well is such an issue um mm-hmm. when it's not really a realistic goal so uh. no but then i tell you what i found interesting i don't i've not heard of that Reykjavik index so i have to look up what that is mm. um but the fact that women pick safety mm-hmm. as, as something they want in the future and mm-hmm. um respect that scares me because if you want safety, it implies you're not safe. Mm. If that's the thing you're seeking, it implies you don't feel safe. Mm. And that's scary. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it makes sense that 
you know, because of all the things that you hear in general and women experience, mm. especially depending on the country that you live in, you might not feel at all. Mm. So. But I mean, there's so many, like, safe, may not feel safe to be a leader. Mm. Because I can tell you, I've also heard that comment from people that are, oh, this leader in particular is too emotional or they're just too emotional so they're, because they're a woman. Mm, yeah, absolutely. And, like, and, the, and the fact is you can't make good decisions if you don't use emotion. You need to use emotion to make good decisions. Yeah. But it's not even, yeah, it's, it's not that men don't get emotional. It's that them getting angry or whatever is just... Isn't- isn't considered emotional right yeah it's so weird so yeah that's bizarre to me but anyway that's what it is but hopefully things are getting better well what what would what would we ask people to do to keep an open mind if you get assigned a female boss (laughs) (laughs) perhaps give them a give them a go as opposed mm. to, you know. I've had, I'm just thinking of all my bosses been female. Mostly, yeah. Mm. I had one male boss. And that, at the very start of my career, I had a male boss and he was really good. Mm. And then I had a female boss who wasn't so good. Mm. But then I've had a female bosses since and they've been really good. I just, I don't think it matters. Mm. I don't think it's that you're male or female. Yeah. To be honest, like if there was equal amount of male and female leaders, I reckon there'd be equal amounts of rubbish leaders in yeah. both. Yeah, absolutely. To be fair. Or not, not as good and excellent because I've had excellent male bosses. I've seen excellent male leaders. Mm. Yeah. Like I think Brock Brown is, is a really good example mm. of a, a fantastic leader. Yeah. You, can, uh, you could stand there all day listing off examples mm. of bad ones. Depends how you define good and bad as well. Mm, yeah exactly but yeah scary that girls between 9 and 18 are picking things like safety mm. and respect as things they want future future roles and that and they're conscious of that, at that they're conscious of that at that age yeah mm. and then the other thing as well is she's right that that journalist that wrote that article mm. if we're not in positions of leadership then the people in power have the I can abuse that power and they already have and they already do yeah taking away rights and and um freedoms for for women because they're yeah because they're yeah. not representation I guess exactly yes you're right it's a lot of pressure for girls but there's some girls that are probably natural leaders mm. and shouldn't be put off and then I guess we just I know it's sad but I guess we just have to accept that we're going to if you want to be a lady, you have to deal with that. You have to get, you're going to have to have a very good sense of self, a very good mindset, mm-hmm. very resilient to be a leader because the fact is you're going to get heap of shit. Yes. Yes. So that's, that's why a leadership coach mm. can be very useful. Exactly. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. You are a leadership coach. Mm. Oh. all right my story i like this and you know every week we really want to celebrate um examples of initiatives that are inc- you know feeding that diversity inclusivity rhetoric yes. and that's what we look for <clears throat> or celebrate successes of um minority peoples that's what we like to talk about if we can find it. And we do, we don't find it easy, do we, to find these stories? Yeah. Um, but anyway, I found this about MAC makeup. MAC makeup was one of the first makeups I could find for my skin color. Oh, really? Yeah, where I'm from, there wasn't, do you know, that's another story. But growing up, like I said, you know, there wasn't many black people. I struggled to find makeup that I could wear. In fact, from, you know, when you were, how old did you say you started wearing makeup? I was probably early teenage years. Mm. So those early teenage years, all the way up to uni, even the first year of uni, I think, my face looked a shade whiter than the rest of me for the whole, 
when I wore makeup, I swear. <laughs> you want to see pictures of my face because yeah. I couldn't find makeup. Yeah. But um, my foundation that I was the colour of my, much of my colour, I just couldn't. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. Mm. So this story is, says, how a lipstick can change a life. Uh-huh. And it's actually Metro, Metro, uh, a Metro news article. Metro is like, I don't know if we have it in Australia. Metro is like, you get a free newspaper as, as you're going to work. The free newspaper. Right, and yeah. You read it on the tube or you read it on the bus or you read, people are handing it out to commuters. So it's a free distribution called Metro. And it's supposed to be community-based. And in London, it would be, be a bit more topical with politics and media and stuff. So it's a drab rainy morning, but you wouldn't know that a MAC co- Cosmetics Carnaby Street store, you wouldn't know that at a MAC Cosmetics Carnaby Street store, a drag queen, charity workers, influencers, and members of the LGBTQ plus community have gathered for our photo shoot in joyful and vibrant energy, all in the name of lipstick. Okay. So MAC launched its three Viva Glam lipsticks back in 1994. The red, plum, and pink beige shades were released to directly benefit the HIV and AIDS charity drive, with none other than RuPaul fronting the posters. And MAC has been donating 100% of the retail price, minus tax, to LGBTQ plus communities ever since. Oh, wow. They say it's more like donating to charity and getting free lipstick in return hmm. rather than buying the stand, standard lippy. To date, hundreds of millions of pounds have been donated worldwide by the makeup brand. And today on World AIDS Day, which was yesterday. Oh, okay. Uh, so yesterday, we're rec- by the time this recording comes out, it'll be a week or so after. But on the 1st of December as well, World AIDS Day. Mm. Mac are donating the retail price of all their other lipsticks, not just the Viva Glam range, to benefit the cause. And somewhere along the way, however, in the glitz of celebrity campaign collaborations with the likes of Lady Gaga, Elton John, and Debbie Harry, the charity message got lost. As many as 85% of Mac customers are unaware of what Viva Glam is. I didn't know, but I don't really buy lipsticks from Mac. Now, the brand wants to reclaim the message, which is why they're foregoing the celebrity face this World AIDS Day and instead extending their charitable pledge across all their lipsticks, not just Be the Glam Shades on December 1st. Mm. So they're shooting the Mac with the Mac ambassadors, trans educators, and people who work on the ground with those, with those the charity efforts support all to find out what actually happens when you buy one of these life-changing lipsticks. Mildred Malaka from Uganda Mm. is a 27-year-old beneficiary of Micro Rainbow, a charity Mac partners with. She tells Metro, coming from where I come from, there's a lot of oppression. You can't express yourself. You're only allowed to wear makeup on certain particularly important events. So wearing it for fun because it makes you feel good is really refreshing. Even seeing men wear makeup here, that would be forbidden. Mm-hmm. So that's an example of someone who it benefits. And she moved from Uganda to the UK, October 2021, as an asylum seeker and describes her life before as not good for her mentally as she's a queer identifying person. There are so many things that breathe a fresh of air here, Mildred explains. I left Uganda because I was being persecuted because I'm gay, so I needed to flee. After coming here, I found the charity programs, and before I didn't know these kinds of things existed. Micro Rainbow do social inclusion programs and the Moving On program, which can help you with your CV and finding work. It's very helpful, even the social programs, because while you're seeking asylum, you're not really allowed to do much, can't work. Some people aren't allowed to study. So it can be depressing just staying in a room doing nothing. So being able to meet other people that can relate and understand is good for your mental health. Otherwise you constantly think, are they going to take me back? What's Mm -hmm. happening to me? 
She hopes to one day work for the charity and help others in similar situations. If people buy the lipstick, they can help support what these charities are running. It makes a big difference, she adds. Sebastian Roker, founder and CEO of Micro Rainbow, says Viva Glam helps publicize the message of what the charity does. He recently used a $50,000 donation, well, £50,000 donation from Mac to refurbish a safe house. The organization also uses its connections to Mac to host makeup masterclasses. A lot of the people we work with have told their whole, have been told their whole lives they are against nature, Sebastian mm. says. So naturally, when they come to the UK, they come with low confidence and self-esteem. Using makeup is one way to get them to feel like themselves and to believe they are worthy of expressing that. Each year, Micro Rainbow works with over a thousand people nationwide through classes, programs, helplines, and safe houses. He says the work we do is best summarized like this. Homeless queer migrants go from being homeless to having a home, go from risking violence and abuse on the streets to being in a welcoming queer environment. Sebastian believes it's important that charity campaigns aren't always heavy and bereft. Yes, we're working with people escaping torture and persecution, but through the lens of makeup, we're looking at how to empower people and give them choice, he adds. The element of fun, it's very much needed. This sentiment is shared by Cheryl Hole, an LGBTQIA plus activist and drag queen, best known for appearing on RuPaul's Drag Race UK. Viva Glam is a campaign she's known for the longest time and says its root message is, we need something to change and we're going to do it through the power of makeup. It's so prominent in the community because it's starting out as the sheer need for a voice for the AIDS and HIV epidemic, she says. Buying one can literally put a homeless person living with HIV and AIDS in a shelter for two days straight, just from one lipstick. And I don't think people realize this applies all year round. It's making changes 24 seven. Cheryl's personal favourite shade of Viva Glam 2, the pink beige, she's sporting in the photo shoot they have here. She believes the celebrities that have fronted the campaign, to the, though they perhaps overshadow the fundraising message, have added light to the lip range, attracting publicity and utilising more platforms to promote sales. As well as sales, a lipstick can stand for something more personal to people, particularly those in the queer community that use makeup as a form of gender expression. Arian Humerang, an influencer and trans activist who wears neutral tone makeup in her day to day, explains, I feel empowered wearing this lipstick, like I'm continuing the legacy of the people that came before me who would have worn this in the 90s. This tiny tube represents so much from all the turmoil that's happened to today where I can comfortably wear makeup and be as queer queer as I can be, without being apologetic about it and without having to hide it. Back in the day, they had to do so many different things to not be known, to not come out. Wearing one of these lipsticks to me represents all of that. Arian believes campaigns like this create a safe space for those affected by the issues Viva Glam is aligned with. Mm. It's also just giving yourself the joy of helping others, she adds. And then it talks more about Mac and it raised and who it other other charities it raised funds for like Positive East, a charity called Positive East, which supports people living with or affected by HIV and AIDS in London. I'm not going to read that, but then I found another story, and I just really like the charity. So another charity that they support with these funds. Um, and I got this from an article. I guess it's a corporate business arts, business publication. It's called 3BL CSR Wired. That's the name of the, the publication. And the article was in celebration of Trans Awareness Week, which we had already had in November. Um, Mac Cosmetics launched inclusive makeup edit by Joseph Harwood. He, she, they. He goes by he, she, they. He, she, and they. All of them and donate £50,000 to Mermaid's Charity. And I just wanted to mention Mermaid's Charities. It's an amazing charity. It's in the UK, and I'm wondering if there's anything like this in here, because there isn't that could do with it. It talks about the Viva Glam, again, 
because it also supports the LGBTQI plus community. And it gives the three main things that the, the Viva Glam does by supporting the LGBTQI plus community. Eliminates stigma and fights for the empowerment of the LGBTQI plus community, specifically assisting homeless and youth alongside regional organizations. Powers women and girls, to fight for equal rights, healthy futures for women and girls, specifically around reproductive and sexual health education, and the HIV and AIDS part, which we just talked about. Um, but I wanted to say what mermaids do. Mermaids have been supporting transgender, non-binary, and gender diverse children and young people and their families since 1995. Mermaids supports transgender, transgender non-binary, and gender diverse children and young people until their 20th birthday, as well as their families and professionals involved in their care. Transgender, non-binary and gender diverse children and teens need support and understanding, as well as the freedom to explore their gender identity. Well, whatever the outcome, Mermaid is committed to helping families navigate the challenges they may face. And I just wanted to mention that because I thought it was great. I'm wondering if there's anything like that here. Not aware. So who knew buying a lipstick? Buying a lipstick can make a difference. You know, some people think, oh, there's all this stuff in the world. Like, the smallest thing can make a difference. I really think what we're doing make, can make a difference. Yeah. Um, buying a lipstick can make a difference. Yeah. Now that we know, because, yeah, I didn't know that I buy MAC lipstick. Now that we know, it's something that if you're considering buying a lipstick, then why not buy the one that Mac is selling? Exactly. So, yeah. I don't actually wear that much lipstick, but now I know that, I'll think twice about which brand of lipstick I buy. I don't think Mac lipstick's perfectly fine as far as I know. I've just got so many. Right, okay. So wrap it up. Are you ready? Yes. But what would you do? <laughs> I'm trying to come up with my own little jingle there. All right, so what would you do, Mino? Mm -hmm. so this is the scenario this is a workplace scenario you you notice that your colleague who is a woman mm. gets spoken over and interrupted more often than others during virtual team meetings yeah I think in this case it would be helpful just to help and so to 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 be the person who says to the person who is interrupting her that wait hang on a second, just let whoever say, Anna, can we just let Anna finish, please? Mm. Um, every time, you know, mm. somebody interrupts and it doesn't have to be Anna, it can be anyone. Just mm. be like, no, let's just wait for her to finish her thought and then you can speak afterwards. So mm. that's very helpful. Good. Cool. Mm. Actually, I've had this in meetings, like, I've had this, I've noticed this, and it's actually not always men that do it, but the mm. fact is, stats show that women are interrupted more than men. Yeah. Right, so that's that's what we're talking about. It. But I have seen that other women interrupt, specific women mm. interrupt people a lot more. Yeah. And I think it's a, a quality. Yeah. And it is, I've done it. I'm, I'm not saying I've never interrupted people. I totally have. But I'm conscious of it. And I'm conscious of doing it purposefully now. Mm. As in, so for example, if I'm chairing a meeting and people are talking and the person who's talking is talking for too long about something that's going to take up too much time. It's, yeah. you know, they're repeating themselves, they're repeating what they've said. That kind of thing, I'll, I have to interrupt them because it's my job to keep. Yeah. Keep us moving through the items and keep on track. So that's purposeful interruption, yes. right? The difference is um, somebody's making a point, you disagree or you have a thought mm. and you have to get it out of your mouth now mm. rather than just waiting for that person to finish what they're saying. Or you disagree and you want to cut, in, cut them off. Mm. And it's very disrespectful. Mm. And, and so there's a difference. Um, there's definitely appropriate time where you may need to interrupt someone yeah um but there's a difference between just interrupting people who's in the middle of an idea or or making a statement about something 
and that and that's the difference and especially when it's repetitive yes yeah I mean I find that if you let the person finish anyway sometimes they clarify what you were gonna you know say in the first place because obviously they haven't finished saying what they've they've wanted to say so instead of interrupting if you take that time to formulate what you're gonna say or whatever then you know it doesn't sound so off the cuff as well so that can be helpful so just wait and let them finish Mm. then then you can Mm. have to say but I think the more people that are a little bit more conscious about it then um the better it is but I have been in meetings where I think it's more because like I've said I have a very female dominated team so there's only usually one or two men in the room anyway and it's usually the female interrupting and it's it's just their personality so Mm. it's not it's not yeah meant to be yeah I get it but just because it's the personality doesn't mean it's a good thing Mm. and and I I agree I've I've seen women do that Mm. where they're constantly there's certain people that will get interrupted a lot yeah and certain people that will do the interrupting yeah yeah and that's really needs managing by whoever's leading that team or whoever's chairing that meeting yes. it's often in meetings when it happens it really needs to be managed mm. so that it's, everybody gets feels like they are heard yes yeah otherwise you get people that will never will never contribute yeah and, and then have great ideas and you have great ideas exactly yeah. So you're right. It just so happens that when they've done the research, it's women that are more regularly interrupting than men. But if you talk about it generally, there are people with personality to do that. Yeah. And people that are more likely to sit back. And it's your job as a leader to get everybody's ideas. Yeah. Everybody's great ideas. Otherwise, if they've not got good ideas or got something of value to contribute, then why are they why are they there? Mm. Yeah. And I think I've been in a couple of meetings where the chair, and I can't remember whether they're male or female, but they've realized, like they've gone through the room and realized that, oh, somebody has an idea, but they haven't spoken up, maybe because they don't, they're intimidated or whatever it is. And they've just stopped everyone and gone, do you have an idea? Do you want to talk? Um, and at, at that point, because they've been prompted, they've gone, oh, yes, I think it's, you know, whatever um and that's really good chairing of a meeting and good leadership right there um to realize that people want to talk and yeah no it's very good exactly and then I guess to the point of what I am you would say because it's like you know what would you do Hmm. if you notice consistently that this person would get over you know interrupted every time they try to talk what would you do I'm not reading what it says here. I would say, personally, I would go take that other person to the side and say, I take both of them to the side mm. separately, have separate conversations. But the person that's doing the interrupting, if it was like a characteristic that they constantly did, yes. I would say, I don't know if you've noticed, mm. um, but you often interrupt this person mm. or other people, they might be just doing it to lots of people mm. um, when they're talking can you think about letting them finish before you make your point I've given that as constructive feedback I said what you say is usually really valuable as well absolutely really valuable and I always want to hear what you have to say Mm. but I'd like to hear what everyone has to say so it's important that we like let people finish speaking without interrupting them so I'd say that and then with the other person say I noticed that when you were talking um, you were interrupted by this person and it and it ha- happens. Is that something you've noticed? See what they're saying. Yeah. yeah, no, whatever. Okay. So I'd just say maybe try this next time. It's up to you. Or I would ask them, what would you do mm. next time if you're interrupted? See what they say. So the idea is for them to come up with their own solution. And if and if they don't have any, any ideas, then I'd have to prompt them and say, maybe you could say. <clears throat> I just want to finish what I was saying. Yeah. Because that's okay. Just that's all you need to say. It doesn't have to be rude or angry with anger. Just say, hold on. Um, I just want to finish what I was saying. Mm. Yeah. Just say it loud enough. Yeah. That's that would be my advice. What would you say? Would you do what would you do? Yeah. 
I think it is important to tell the person who's interrupting that, you know, just let people talk, especially if it's a pattern of behavior, right? But definitely, or, and if you are in that meeting, I would say that you need to, and you, the, the person who's been interrupted doesn't say anything, then, you know, you should, people should be like, let her or him, if it's a him, um, mm-hmm. finish talking before, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. So that's helpful, recognizing it so he can help the person. Is, um, yeah. yeah. The reason I speak to the person who is being interrupted <clears throat> is because can empower them to empowering yeah. them because otherwise you're putting them in the victim mode like i'm helpless i can help myself yeah. so i'm gonna do it i'm gonna i'm gonna rescue you yeah absolutely yeah, yeah. anyway what does it say this is why it matters it's undermining to be repeatedly interrupted mm. of course it means that the team loses out on the woman's ideas and insights if it's a woman Plus, in a virtual context, meetings can carry more weight than than they otherwise might without informal interactions in the office. So if you're not seeing each other in the office, mm. this the virtual meeting is your only decision-making discussion forum. Mm. So without informal interactions in the office, virtual meetings become the central avenue for information sharing, brainstorming, and reputation building. Mm. It's so true, if I think about it. I'll come back to this in a minute. You notice that your colleague who is a woman gets spoken over and interrupted more often than others during virtual team meetings. Mm. So what do you do? In the moment, you can use the chat feature to write something like, uh, can we circle back to Jessica? Like, you know, because like you said, I'll let that person speak. So instead of saying it, you could just type in the chat, can we circle back to Jessica? Mm. Um, In the long run, encourage norms that promote equal participation by everyone using the chat feature when they want to chime in, so it's not interrupting. Mm. That's a good idea. You think, oh, I need to say this. Because sometimes, and I'm so guilty of this, I think it and I feel like I have to say it or else I forget. Mm. Yeah. So it's like write it down is the Mm. thing, but you can put it in the chat and then it doesn't interrupt them and they can look at it when they finish. Assuming it's a virtual meeting, of course. Yeah, like using the chat feature when you want to chime in. If you're brainstorming, have people take turns. There's lots of methodologies for that, Mm. activities for that kind of equal participation. Or use a virtual brainstorming tool. You can also use breakout rooms to create small groups. Mm. One study found that women get similar amounts of airtime as men in groups of six or fewer. But less, less than men when in groups of seven or more. Interesting. Okay. Interesting. In general, women are interrupted far more often than men. Researchers believe that this happens just as often in virtual meetings, if not more. This may be rooted in a common form of bias. People often value women's contributions less highly than men's. Mm. And, and it's called performance bias. And that just means there's perception that women perform less well than men. It's a perception. It is a perception. In lots of things, women drive this, for example. Yes, <clears throat> exactly. That's a, a bias stereotype but that's out there. Mm. Mm. It's true. It's about letting everybody have an equal voice at the table. Yeah, and not missing out on good ideas. Yeah, I'm missing out on good ideas. And actually, I'm thinking about scenarios from a corporate days where people were perceived as not contributing, like this, the perception of that person from not speaking yes. during meetings is that they don't have anything valuable to contribute. Yeah. They are not a good leader, boss, manager, right? I'm totally heard about that. Yeah. And then I've actually worked with this person as my boss, let's say, mm. and they've been really good. Mm. So that's why I think it's important to not only have conversation with the interrupting people, but the people that are allowing people to interrupt them or not speaking. Yeah. Because that the fact is, if you're not speaking, you're not contributing visibly, the pub, there must have been behind the scenes to get where they are. Mm. And one, smaller groups. Yeah. They would speak more. And that's what I'd actually thinking about. I've noticed that. In really small groups, like two or three or four people, they're way more vocal. But when it's a whole, yeah. when it's a lot bigger, yeah. don't hear a peep. Yeah. 
And plus, and I, I think some people speak because they want to be seen as contributing, but they're not actually saying anything of note, or maybe they're just regurgitating, you know, what other people have said or, you know, summarizing people. I've, I've known people like that. And it's just like, you don't need, need to do that. <laughs> so, but they want to be seen as contributing. So yeah. they yeah. do. And they probably, and probably the perception is they are generally. Exactly. When Even, they're it's actually that. So. Yeah. Yeah. So strategies, like from either side. Um, but I've noticed that perception of people that, of not being good managers, leaders, or whatever, contributors, because they don't speak in big groups. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. It is intimidating as well in a big group. So I can understand people who are a little bit shyer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, is that a word? A little bit shy not doing so but yes hmm. okay okay well i think that's it have you got anything else to add no these are my pearls of wisdom <laughs> all right then well that's it from us until next week happy hump day bye okay.